one. All right, all right, everybody. Ed Diaz here. What is it? Day 2000 of uh, sheltering in place? It feels that way. Doesn't it feel kind of like I should be wearing an ankle bracelet? I think we all are. Right? Yeah. Gosh, well, everybody, this is a super huge treat I have here. Samita Basu, who is an estate planning attorney extraordinaire. We're going to talk about some planning today, especially under these conditions. It's unfortunate. You know, there's been a lot of deaths, a lot of people getting this COVID-19. However, one of the things that's coming up is the lack of planning, because we never think this is going to happen to us particularly the fact that it happens simultaneously to everybody on planet Earth at the same time. This is like historic. I've never seen this. And today is my 52nd year birthday, and I've never seen this in my 52 years. So I can imagine that most of you who are watching have never seen this unless you're like 150 years old or something and you live through the Spanish flu, which was something similar, but still hasn't had the gigantic impact. What it's also highlighted is the fact that we all are one. We are one race. And therefore, I'm hoping that this information really, really blesses a lot of people out there because we're going to talk about some fundamentals, things that you should have in place, things to think about, and who better to do that than Samita, who's been doing this a long time, and she's going to kick it off by giving us kind of what are you seeing, Samita, out there in your conversations with clients? Are you seeing more people come out of the woodwork and actually having the phone ring your direction as opposed to you calling them, reminding them of the importance of planning, especially because if you don't have a plan, guess what? The government has one for you, and theirs is not going to be nearly as good as the one that Samita is going to do for you. Yeah, so um, first of all, thanks for having me, Ed. I yeah, really appreciate the opportunity people on this really important issue. Um, what we are seeing right now in our practice is yes, people who actually had reached out to us previously, instead of us following with them, they are suddenly reaching out to us and saying, hey, this is something that is suddenly at the top of my list and I really wanna get this process started. Um, how can I do this? What are, what are the things that I need? Um, everybody needs an estate plan. Uh, what that estate plan actually consists of depends on your family situation, depends on what you own, depends on how old your kids are or what your particular family needs are. But everybody needs an at a bare minimum a will, a power of attorney, and an advanced health care directive. Especially now, the power of attorney and advanced health care directive are things that if you are a high risk individual and you are concerned about your exposure to the virus, those are documents that you really need to get in place now at a bare minimum, everybody should have those. And so we are encouraging everybody to do those at a bare minimum. And those are documents that provide guidance to the people that you name in those documents on how to take care of you financially and how to take care of you medically. What are your wishes for your medical care? So those are bare minimums that we think everybody, no matter what your situation, everybody should have those. What are typical things that you see in an advanced medical directive of decision-making items? That Sometimes, let's be honest, this isn't exactly like, hey, what kind of coffee do you like? These right. are sometimes you know, difficult conversations to have. They are. And so an advanced healthcare directive talks about the kind of care you would want if you were in an irreversible condition. Um, would you want to be on life support indefinitely or do you not? Um, what do you want to have? Do you want organ donation or not? Um, is that going to contradict some other choice you've made like on your driver's license or some other document that you've signed somewhere else? That's a good the point. other thing that is healthcare directive can do if you are suffering from some sort of a um, another underlying condition you can put in to your advanced healthcare directive what kind of treatment you would want for that condition we've had clients who say you know I have XYZ disease if that disease were to progress to this certain stage I don't want treatment and you can actually put that language into your advanced healthcare directive if you are aware of a diagnosis and if you are aware of um, an unfavorable progression of that diagnosis or that disease, you can own your preferences for that. Um, it can really be customized to your individual 
individual health need. The other thing that we tell people is when you pick agents for your advanced healthcare directive, pick people relatively close by and people who will follow your wishes. If, if you decide that you don't want to be on life support and you pick an agent who sincerely disagrees with that, maybe it's your spouse or your child and they feel like you should be, that's not a good person to put as your agent for advanced healthcare directive. You want people who are going to follow your wishes even though they may not align with what they think your wishes should be. So those are important and difficult discussions to have, but things that we really yeah. should be talking about, especially now. I couldn't agree more. What are some of the, the components of a, a well-done estate plan? So a well-done estate plan will be one that actually really specifically deals with your unique family situation. And every family is unique. I in the seven years we've been doing this, we have never drafted two estates exactly the same. Yeah. As we can ask questions to our clients, we get the nuances of what is actually happening in the family, their concerns for their children. Maybe one child is very self-sufficient. One child is in the, you know, older and still living at home and not as self-sufficient. Not always can everything be divided 50-50 amongst your children. Yes, does that happen yeah. sometimes? But a lot of times, you know, you need to look at the actual family situation happening and deal with those and put in contingencies into your estate plan for your kids, your beneficiaries, your family, your charities, whatever it is, uh, specific to your needs and wants. So a good estate plan is going to be very specific to your situation. A one size fits all approach is never going to be advisable. I, I couldn't agree more. What are some of the biggest misconceptions about estate planning? I think the biggest misconception is um, the two are one is, you know, I don't have things. I don't have a lot of money. I own a house, but I have a big mortgage. So I don't really have an estate. Um, the word estate usually brings up the concept of a mansion or something like that in right. people's minds. And that's not true. Your estate is everything that you own. And in the eyes of the law, it's the fair market value of everything that you own, not the net value, the gross value. That's so correct. you probably own way more than you think. Um, True. That's one misconception. The other, I think, misconception is that this is a cumbersome process, and it's really not. We have gone out of our way to make everything tech-friendly. Um, even before the pandemic, our firm has um, been enabled to operate largely remotely. The entire process can be done online up until the final signing. Um, and it's definitely worth the time invested, but we really try to make it easy for you. So we carry the burden. We are driving the process, not you. We're guiding you through the whole thing. So you really have somebody to walk you through everything and explain what's happening. So it's not as difficult as people think. Yeah, and I think it actually, I mean, I look at it this way, is like, isn't that really a great way to actually vet an estate planning attorney? Are they easy to work with? Are they technologically friendly? I mean, or are they living in the 1950s and it's so cumbersome and they speak in these terms and nobody can understand, like, what language is that? Right. right? Right. I mean, I, I'm a big believer that if you can't explain it in a way people understand it, then you don't know it well enough. I completely agree. Right? Yeah. Let's I, talk a little bit about probate and what that is and how this plays into this picture. Or right. So um, two things to know here. One is that the current estate tax um, amounts are very high. So it's over $22 million now for a married couple, over a million, 11 million per individual. So if the value of everything that you own, and that means everything, fair market value of everything that you own does not exceed as an individual $11 million or $22 million a uh, married couple, and those are approximate amounts. They keep changing, they're indexed, and they they put every year, but approximately. If the, everything you own is below those limits, um, heirs don't have to worry about paying any additional taxes when you pass away. Seen concern for a large majority of the population is going to be the probate process. Because while you don't have to worry about estate tax, most likely, you do have to worry about probate. And probate in California is a process whereby the court oversees the gathering of all your assets, 
the payment of all your debts and the distribution of your assets. So if you, even if you have a will, the court still oversees everything, they will just distribute assets per the terms of your will, and that your will is valid. If you don't have a will, the court will distribute assets per the law, which goes by blood relation. If you're not close to your family, that's not something you want. Right. Other thing to note is that the probate process in California before the pandemic was running about 18 months to 24 months in wow. any county in the Bay Area. With the pandemic and the closing of the courts, now you're talking about a significant delay in how those cases are being handled. So all of our probate clients now are in limbo, waiting for the courts to reopen because anything that happens in probate has to be approved by the court. So you're talking about a lengthy, expensive wow. to get your assets to your beneficiaries. So if it's you're like kid, a bad lawsuit, it's bad. It's very, very lengthy. I had no idea, honestly, that it was that stretched. Yes, it's very wow. stretched. Um, hearing dates can get postponed um, through no fault of you know your kids or anybody like that. It's uh, so therefore you're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And so we wow. are big proponents of avoiding the probate process fees are set by law you're looking at anywhere from it ends up being about over two and a half to three percent sometimes four percent of your total assets um, is what you're going to end up paying um, in probate fees not including court costs whereas if you did an estate plan and and then had to do trust administration for your trust you're looking at more like one and a half percent um, of your estate of costs, some of which you pay up front for your estate planning and some is paid in trust administration. Right. But right. significantly less expensive than going through probate. So I always look at this, look, it's like anything else, right? It's like having a financial plan as well. It, you don't look at it as a cost. You look at it as an investment. This is an investment in your legacy because look, when you die, you're, you're set. You don't have to worry right. about coffee and the price of houses anymore. Right. But everybody you left behind are the ones. So if you love the people in your life, you want to step outside of yourself and start thinking about them the older you get. And matter of fact, you want to do it as quickly as possible. I mean, when is a great time? What's the youngest age you think a person should start thinking about drafting an estate plan? Well, I think um, the minute you have your kids turn 18, they should have an advanced health care and a power of attorney because in case they meet with an accident or something happens, once they're 18, they're adults. And so as mom and dad, you can't just automatically step in for them. They, the, any hospital or bank, you know, financial institution is going to need documents. So everybody should have those from the age of 18 onwards. Um, I think once you start working, a will is a good idea to add on. Yep. And then once you have children, um, whether or not you own property, um, you should have a trust. And if you don't have children, once you own property, you need a living trust. Or if your assets are over uh, $50,000, then you need to think about whether or not you have children, you should think about a trust because that's the limit for probate. Anything over $150,000 in fair market value of your assets means that you have to go through probate. So um, those are the, the metrics. Generally, you know, young families, you definitely want to have a trust, take care of your, make sure your kids are taken care of, that you nominate guardians for them. All of that is envisioned in a complete estate plan. So there are different things that you need at different stages in your life. Um, it's a living, breathing um, yeah, plan. Document. It doesn't, it's not one size fits all and it will be, more comprehensive as your family and your needs change. That makes total sense. So how do you recommend people start? So I think the first thing to do is to act, educate, you, you know, people should themselves about what is a, an estate plan, what is a living trust. There are a lot of good resources online where you can read about them to get a basic understanding of what it is. I would recommend that people do their due diligence, call around, find an estate planning attorney that's willing to work with you, um, willing to in the way you want to work. So if you want to work, we're able to do that for you. Um, make sure that you like them. 
at the end of the day, yeah. you have to feel comfortable speaking yeah. with them. If Trust and likability. Right. I mean, they have to be accessible. They have to return your phone calls. You know, they have to be able to provide you with some information in a way that you can understand. If you don't like the person in the initial consult, don't go with them. Um, have that due diligence. And then, you know, you kind of have to just jump into the pool and, and start the process because the only way to really be protected is to get those documents completed. Yep. You can't get, you can't swim if you don't get wet. You got to just jump in. That's right. right. Well, I'm going to take it a step further and uh, make the recommendation of everybody's watching to call Samita. You know, call her today. Call her now. Have a conversation. A, she doesn't bite. Two, she's extremely knowledgeable. And three, am I safe to say that you would give everybody that calls using my name a free consult? Absolutely. Well, there you go. Look, now you have zero excuse. Now I just cornered you. All right. Make that call. Reach out to her. How do people get a hold of you, by the way? So we can be reached... uh, site which is www.nortonbasu.com or you can reach us at our office number which is 408-850-7250 say that ed referred you and we're happy to schedule a time to talk to you for free well thank you very much for that generous offer well you heard it here first again don't forget hit the subscribe button and to the right of that you got that bell that bell's not in there just to be static press on it because every time I drop a video, you're going to get notified. So thank you so much, Samita. Thank you all for watching. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay home. All right. Have a good day. Take care.